Hello and welcome to Collateral Global TV. I'm Ellen Townsend, a member of the Collateral Global Scientific Advisory Board. In this instalment of Collateral Global Conversations, I'm delighted to be talking with Professor Carl Hennigan, who's just published a review of systematic reviews on child and adolescent mental health in the pandemic. Hi, Carl. Hi, Ellen. So, Carl, let's get straight into it. Um, could you describe the methods that you used to synthesise the evidence in this review? Well, you've mentioned a couple of words there, systematic reviews and synthesise. Let's just explain what that means. Systematic reviews have been around now for quite a few decades, and they're a method which says what we're going to do is ask a question about healthcare in this case about mental health in children and adolescents during the COVID pandemic restriction phase. And instead of doing traditionally a literature review where I pick a few studies that may or may not support my argument, what we try and do is be systematic and try and find all of the studies that answer that question. And so systematic reviews have to have a comprehensive search strategy. They generally look at two or more really big databases, and there are some significant ones in this pandemic, like the WHO runs one, Medline runs one, which try to obtain all of the studies relevant to COVID. So a systematic review is what we consider is the highest level of evidence to understand a question and find an answer. And it stops you cherry picking, which many people have done throughout this pandemic to see either side of the argument. So that's a systematic review. Now, what we did in the first instance is try and look for, go to that level. Instead of doing a systematic review, there's been so much information and evidence published on COVID. It's been quite unbelievable. I mean, we're probably talking about 2,500 to 3,000 articles a week. And therefore, there's been a lot of people who've done the systematic reviews. So we went and looked for those systematic reviews that that have been done. And we found 17 of them. So... Obviously, there's a lot of interest in terms of mental health problems in children and adolescents. And we feel one of the most important aspects in this pandemic is to make sure we push forward and make available the information, particularly if we decide to make restrictions again in the future, we understand the impact on these important conditions like mental health in children and adolescents. So in essence, you've synthesised the worldwide literature without cherry picking on this really important question. So on that basis, with this really rigorous and comprehensive evidence, what would you say the main findings of this review review are? And you know, what's the key take home message? Yeah, I, look, I think if we look at, there's a consistent, the literature is pretty consistent that there's a significant severe impact on children and adolescents when it comes to mental health. And one of the sort of biggest reviews that did a pooled meta-analysis that's pulling the studies together suggested worsening of behaviour or any psychological symptoms occurred in about eight in 10 children. Now, that's quite significant. And the evidence shows why did that occur? There are probably a couple of reasons that are really important in this. One is COVID fear and anxiety. And then the second issue is also social isolation. That came because of restrictive measures. At one point, I think there was something like 150 schools, countries had closed schools. Some places, countries closed them for two or more months. Some have been a year. So those two features are really important. What they also show is very high rates in the restrictive phases of the important conditions. Anxiety, one in three children and adolescents. Depression, maybe about four in ten. A couple of features that were interesting in the data as well and worth noting that older adolescents seem to fare worse than younger children. And I think we can discuss why that might be. Second is females did slightly worse than males. And also that there were a couple of things that were really interested in what we call protective issues. And those protective issues were social connectedness complete opposite of social isolation, and what we call pro-social behaviours. The idea that you do something for the people around you protects you and your mental health. Just simple things like opening a door, which we do on a daily basis, makes us feel good about the world. And so altruistic behaviours can have an important effect on reducing our mental health behaviours. And so I think this is 
a report that actually shows there's a severe impact. There are yeah. some, some limitations in the evidence that I think we can discuss, but I think it's worth stopping there and, and saying that's where we are in terms of the severe impact of restrictive phases in the pandemic. Yeah, I social isolation was something that I was really worried about from the start, from the research that we've done with young people and um, knowing the association, for example, between social isolation and suicide ideation. And um, I think um, there've been quite a few studies that, that, that link those two things. So let's talk about the impacts that seem to be um, more prevalent in, in the older adolescents and in, in females. So what, what's happening there, do you think? Yeah, I think that's a really important. I think what what's interesting or important in life is as we 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 try we move to being adults. There's a lot going on in the world, isn't there? We're talking about your emotional development, your physical development, and you're going into the world and interacting with the world around you. And that emotional development, psychological development is incredibly important in them formative years. Now, there was one particular fact, which I think is incredibly interesting and important in all this, is that about half of all mental health is apparent by the age of 14. So many of these disorders, you can start to see the beginnings of in early life. And once you understand that basic fact, you understand that combination of your emotional well-being, the environment you live in in them early years, is incredibly vital to your development. Now, I think we've got a problem because we don't actually talk about or teach people about moving into adulthood and the development and the issues you would face. And, and I think if we interrupt that phase, we can really do damage in a way that we don't understand the consequences, the medium to long-term consequences. And I think we have to start asking questions about this important aspect of development. Now, keto is in any interventions you decide. And this is the Article 3.1 of the Childhood Convention on Their Human Rights, is that basically any decision a public institution makes, that actually the primary consideration should be the benefit of the child. Not the benefit of grandma, not the benefit of mum and dad, benefit of the child. And therefore, if you decide to lock down, you should be doing a cost-benefit analysis of all of the issues that are faced that might impact on children. So it's not just we reduce your risk of infection. What are the downsides? And therefore, when you decide to close schools or you restrict people's social connectedness, there are many harms to that. And I suspect if you did a cost-benefit analysis, you'd find it very difficult to say we're going to restrict schools with a virus that has an impact, very limited impact in that age group. But actually, the decisions you make have a profound impact going forward, and it could be given that development phase for quite some time. Yes, I, I agree. And, I, and it feels to me like we have done a mass experiment in adolescent development. We know from neuroscience studies that this is an extraordinarily um, important period for brain development where the brain kind of reshapes itself uh, which is a process called pruning um, in in relation to things that we're exposed to in the world so if we're doing music if we're doing sport if we're interacting all these things really contribute to how we develop and we've kind of curtail, all curtailed all of that um, and so I agree with you that this is a a particularly sensitive period of development that we've essentially kind of messed about with. Do you want to say something about the quality of the evidence? So you alluded to the fact that in some of these reviews, the evidence perhaps wasn't as robust as we'd like it to be. Yeah, so there are a couple of things about how you do these studies that limit the quality of the evidence and suggest some of the estimates may fluctuate significantly. And when we look at the evidence, we call that heterogeneity. The heterogeneity is very high, and that means the estimates vary quite significantly. So they could, in one study, it could be 20%. In another study, it could be 40%. You look at the pooled analysis, you go, it's 30%. But actually, there's very different things going on. And there are a couple of features. One is the population and how you sample the population. And if you use what's called a convenience sample, 
people who may come forward or self-select, you may overestimate the prevalence as opposed to a random sample. And there are very few studies that do a random sample. Second is there are very few studies that are what we call longitudinal. They're following up children in time points, the same children, to see what's going on. And I think that's important. And then third is a significant source of heterogeneity is the actual instruments you use to measure things like depression and anxiety. In one study, one review, it showed there was the studies used 18 different instruments. And some studies use the same instrument with a different cutoff. Well, then you'll get a different rate of depression. Now, Also, what concerns me is the generalizability. There are many countries, even the UK, which we've only got one or two studies done on mental health in children. And I actually think what we need is longitudinal studies which use the same instruments and allow for cross-comparison across countries. And we keep repeating that because we want to understand, is the problem getting better? or worse over the medium to long term. Now, there was a really helpful report by Save the Children who'd gone to about 47 countries. And they showed actually, wherever you were in the world, most mental health problems literally doubled. And I think there needs to be more of that type, a unified body, which comes together and says, look, we're gonna start to look at this in a way we can provide accurate data but actually a consistent picture over time. Because if these rates are maintained over the next few years, we have serious problems going forward. Absolutely, I agree. And I think the other strength of doing those longitudinal designs is that we can start to pick apart the effects of the restrictions as opposed to sort of general concerns about the pandemic. And that's that's something that's really difficult in, in many areas of research related to the pandemic. To what extent was it the restrictions? To what extent was it the pandemic itself? Well, I think we can actually answer some of that because there are particular items such as excessive fear Mm. that actually show about 20 to 25% of children report excessive fear within the restrictive phases of the pandemic. Mm. And I think this is one of the things we've talked about a lot is that actually you have to de-escalate some of the panic and fear because that actually has detrimental effects. It can have detrimental effects in adults. It can stop how it can reduce how you engage with the health services when you have another health problem. But I think particularly in children, it can have significant impacts because I think as an adult, you can see a before and an after. We can see at some point there'll be a return to normal. But if you're in them formative years and you've got excessive fear, you have to really work hard to understand what the future is going to be like when you don't have them experiences. And I think this is an important message for parents, for people at school, is our job is to reduce the fear and de-escalate that fear, because I think that can have an impact, particularly on people's and children's anxiety going forward. And I think also institutions, the media, the government has has a sort of a duty to not excessively create anxiety in the wider population. But as we said about the human rights and the conventions is in children, is it in their interest if we make a fearful message? And I remember one particular, this is about you would kill grandma. And you know, you go, how is that feasible for a 12, 13 year old to make sense of that statement? When actually the most beneficial thing for them may be to see grandma and give her a hug. Absolutely. It's something that's that's kept me awake at night, actually, some of that messaging and how it might be impacting on children. And something that I hear a lot and I see a lot in the media is, oh, well, children are resilient. They'll bounce back. Uh, and, I, and that feels to me quite an outdated understanding of what resilience is. And for me, I don't know what you think. Resilience about it to some degree, or an important degree, I think, the scaffolds and supports that we have in the community that can help young people negotiate their way towards resilience. And we've, we've just detonated all of that. We've just removed it from them when we've shut down schools and when we've stopped them from, you know, seeing their friends and family. So, I, I, you know, I've been a doctor now for nearly 25 years, and I think it's been interesting, the transition with mental health in that period of time. And as a GP, if it had gone back 20 years ago, there was such a stigma that people would often present with other problems, like I've got back pain, doctor, when underlying that was a mental health issue. Mm -hmm. And and what we've tried to do is change the 
the, the the narrative so that people can feel not comfortable but you know actually it's not a stigma on you if you have a mental health problem it's an issue that once you start to think about understand you may part be on a journey to starting to think how you solve this what we have to remember is i think it's easy in life to look back in time and go well actually they'll get over it but actually those formative years into university years are incredibly important in your development as an adult and you know many mental health disorders if they're not in children and adolescents some of the severe ones like schizophrenia develop in them young adults don't they in that 20 to 25 year age group ocd obsessive compulsive daughter is a disorder that develops in young people so i think it's not helpful to say they'll they'll deal with it and they'll be resilient i think it's more important that we look towards particularly those interventions that we should actually almost if we're going to make and happen they cannot be done under a coronavirus act they need to be debated and say look actually is this policy in the best interest of children and i'll give you one a good example of that is there was a report by the uk children's commissioner that assessed the inpatient mental health wards during covid-19 yeah and it showed that uh, that about more than two about 70% suspended family visits at some point between March and May, while about 30% continued. Yeah. Despite the fact, so the first thing is to say, at that severe end of the spectrum, one of the most important things is your family and friends, because that is protective. But what was interesting is you would expect that those that suspended visit had higher rates of coronavirus than those that didn't. Well, actually, they both had the same level of coronavirus. So the decision to suspend was independent of an outbreak. And so it comes down to somebody's personal preference. Now that can't be right. That's not evidence-based and that's not what we should be doing. And so while we are doing all of these things in the community and all this in these high-risk environments we're having profound impacts and because we can't see them nobody is really thinking about the consequences. But Having months on end where you can't see your family and friends when you've got a severe mental health problem, to me, seems not right and actually is one of those issues in the in the round that we have to say, how can we let this happen? And in the future, we have to think differently about the path we take and who makes those decisions. I think that's right. And I and I think there's been a sort of COVID myopia that's that's gripped the nation that we're thinking about this one problem and everything else is being sort of pushed aside. And I think as we rec- recover, mental health really does need to be front and, and centre. So I just wanted to ask you, we have this high quality evidence from systematic reviews now. I mean, we have a lot of evidence. Why does that particular type of evidence matter for decision making in terms of policy and practice? Why- well, yeah, no, that's so one of the key things about an evidence-based approach is you're going to use some evidence to inform the decision. Well, what we often say at the lowest end is, is my opinion. What do I think is what we should do? And we all differ over our opinions about what to do. And it's interesting, when you find people completely different differ about an intervention, it's often avoiding the evidence. So it allows your opinion, your position, and it allows you to be political. When the evidence is clear, though, you'll often see that actually clinicians will practice in a similar direction. A very good example like that might be aspirin in a heart attack. Very good evidence from randomized control trials that has been put into systematic reviews. If you have a heart attack, I'm going to provide you and give you 300 milligrams of aspirin. Good, high quality evidence. So what we're saying here is right now we've got good evidence that actually restrictive phases And certain features like COVID fear and anxiety and social isolation cause significant detrimental effects. So in a policy initiative, this is what's missing in the narrative. And what we're trying to do with the reports in Collateral Global is say these should now be used to inform the decisions in the future. Because if we get to this position again, we can't afford to panic like we've done last time and make lots of poor quality decisions that have harmful consequences. So what would your policy recommendations be in, term, in terms of practice and policy? 
it's all well and good. We know the situation is bad. As you said earlier, it's severe. We know the impact is severe. But what should we be doing now? What should we be doing to support young people and, and make sure we don't make things worse by doing the same things again? So there are two things, I think, separate. Let me let me talk about the policy initiative. I think what happens is, and it's happened on multiple occasions in this country and in many countries, is policy uh, decision makers have panicked at a last minute and made decisions within 24, 48 hours based on a single entity, which is as a coronavirus infection and it's out of control. This is actually, if they had looked at the data, they've got more time, they think, to be prepared and actually go, right, well, we need a cost-benefit analysis to understand this. You can do that. I mean, you've, we, you know, seven to 10 days. And that's what we do for all other interventions in healthcare. We do not give interventions in healthcare because we think they're a good idea or because we panicked into using them. We have a cost-benefit analysis that weighs up the benefits and the harms and looks at all of that in the round and says, should we intervene? That's what's needed to be done from a policy. From a particular aspect now of individuals, I think the de-escalation of fear and anxiety is really important. But there are many things as we go around our life that keeps that fear and anxiety going. As you go into the shops and see people wearing a mask, that keeps the fear heightened. Much of the messaging that comes out of many groups is about, you know, actually we're going into a winter now. There's going to be 60,000 deaths from flu. There's going to be more problems with COVID at Plan B. So we keep having this almost catastrophizing of the message which has an impact on some people to say, I'm ignoring it, but on a certain section of society to go, I'm heightened anxiety because of this, and it's making me more depressed. So we see a divergence. So it's not having an impact in a way we want it to. But actually, our problem is in the modern era of social media, 24-hour news, we tend to click on these measures <laughs> and have a read and, and then take it on board. Now, it's interesting. We're doing a review in university students and health students and we haven't finished it yet, but it's it's interesting. In there, what it suggested is that people who read too much into the news and looked at too much news actually were more anxious, more depressed, which is excellent, you know, fits with what you'd expect to see. So I think at some point, number one is you have to take a break. Number two is you have to have de-escalation policies. And number three is a family and friends unit. You have to have a social connectedness ability. And one of the things I'd say is having pro-social behaviours. Um, and one of, an example for me, for instance, is my cousin lives alone. So in social isolation, I would ring him on a daily basis just to mm. contact with him. That's, to me, made me feel good. It's pro-social. And we could have a chat and we could connect. And I could talk to him about the realistics. And at the end of the day, he said it was fantastic because you helped me understand some of the issues that were going on around me. While you're in isolation, watching the news, that's in, heightening in your fear and anxiety. So I think, you know, just to finish, I think the concept of pro-social behaviours are really important. And as we come out of this, our fundamental aim, and I think our fundamental philosophy in life is about being connected socially and we need to really think about how we do that well, particularly for children and adolescents going forward. Do we think we know what children and adolescents want? Has their voice been heard? Have they have they been um, in, invited to the debate in any meaningful way, do you think? No, and I think that's interesting because when we come to vaccines, we use this skillet competence and say, well, they can make considerable decisions, consent for very important interventions that the benefits and quantification of the harms are a difficult decision about what you do but i'm important people are informed so we we allow them to make very high level decisions but then in some of these decisions we take them completely out of the arena so i think we are in a world where i think part of any inquiry or part of any impact assessment really should go to children and say what impact did this have what was the on the ground, the impact on you, I think is in the mainstream media, organisations like the BBC have virtually ignored children's decision making in all this and could have done a much better job to represent views. And I think we as a society, you know, there are two bits of society that I think are incredibly important. One is very elderly, you know, how you treat your elders. And we've seen that's not gone well. 
in care homes is you can basically say you get what you deserve if you if you don't look after your elders but also how you look after children and how you look after their educational development is incredibly important to what happens next and i'd say input into education is essential for health and well-being going forward and we know that's the case you transition educational levels you'll be better off once you're better off your health will get better you will you know and and that's well established that basic principle so i think we do have to look at how we fund education how we look after our children in the future and how we don't intervene and create harm and i think also how we allow them to do the things that they want to do so sort of reflecting on the big ask that the children's commissioner um, published recently and I think children they wanted to focus on mental health and well-being and they wanted to focus on all those activities that promote mental health and well-being such as music the arts sports in fact all the things that are at danger of being taken away the minute we think cases arises and, and so on those those things are hugely protective and I think undervalued in schools presently yeah and I think I think there's quite a few, you know it's a sort of the, the blindingly obvious, I often say this, you just look at some things we did in, in terms of intervention, like stopping outdoor sports, that you look at it and go, just as a parent from a common sense aspect, how can you justify that sort of intervention? And they just did not make sense in any format. And whoever's involved in that is obviously in a panic state and hasn't fought through the consequences. And I think those sorts of issues are just now on the table for discussion. We shouldn't forget that they happened, that we need to look at it and say, as I've said, these are just unacceptable decisions. Now, your point is, I mean, as a parent, I know if I said, you know, like my children do what they want, we might have a bit of trouble with <laughs> consequences. But, you know, actually, there are certain aspects in life that actually important development. If you've missed out on 18 months of your sports development, what happens if you're a top sportsman right now? You are basically set back and missed out on all that. What happens in some of the educational issues is a great problem. And I think, but the well-being is now paramount of children. And I think in all messaging, it, it is this de-escalation of the fear and anxiety has to change so that we can get people moving into the world with self-esteem, confidence, an ability to go about their daily lives and interact in a socially connected way. And I think, you know, as parents, if that's where your children get to, you know, show, show me the child and I'll show you the man or I'll show you the woman. If you get to that period when your children get into the world and that's been achieved, you can feel great sense of, you know, achievement that actually they're going to be all right. Yeah, that you fostered a sense of interdependence, that they feel secure in exploring the world and, and, and doing all of that. And I think I'm hearing that we as adults need to model um, pro-social, normal, in quotes, behaviour so that this recovery can can really start to take place for young people. Yeah, well, with, there's no cost to being pro-social, is there? There's a cost to your time. There's a cost to you thinking about other people. And I think, you know, we I think we do these things without thinking about them in normal life. And I think there was a great surge for people to do this at the beginning of the pandemic. If you look at the volunteers who signed up, I think there's a million people said, I'm here to help. And I think we have to capture that in some way, because I think in society, there are important issues out there where people can contribute. And it's good for you and yourself when you do that. You know, and that's why people volunteer. That's why people take part in charities, because it's good for ourselves. It makes us feel good about our, who we are. I also think, you know, there was some I asked about what children, and particularly the adolescents, wanted to do. And many of them actually did want to volunteer in one survey. I think we discussed that and you go, well, that's really interesting. What can we get them doing to be active so they can feel part of contributing in the middle of this? Well, actually, they could have been doing the shopping for the person who lives down here at the street alone who actually is socializing because it's in their risk because they're high risk and I think these are the features we've got to look at differently going forward. So how does that feed into research what do you think 
what's the research that should happen next um, yeah, now think, that we know the how bad things are what 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 should we be focusing on i think now i think it's very clear that we do these longitudinal surveys for weight and height and we look at all sorts of features of children in that sense and you know we've looked at it and said oh we've got a bit of a problem with obesity that's where we need to focus i think now we need to think of how we put together national comparative surveys to see where we fit with the rest of the world and how how we can monitor that so that actually if things are getting worse, we can start to think about the exposures that might be increasing the amount of anxiety and depression in society, but also it will help us think about how we intervene. And that has to be random sampling. So you're not, can be, you know, because if you self-select people, you may overestimate the prevalence. And I think that should become part of a sort of national observatory approach, but particularly thinking being mindful about some organizations like Save the Children where you might combine with, so you can compare this to globally in terms of particularly what's happening in low resource settings, what's happening in developing countries, and look at where the real impact of restrictions is occurring and causing the most damage. Yes, I think that's a really important priority. And um, I mean, there are existing databases that we have some, you know, useful pre-pandemic baseline data from, but perhaps we now need to, you know, think about setting up some new ones that can be um, a global resource. And I think that would be really powerful. Yeah, and I think within that, the the, the instruments you use, the measurement tools, mm. uh, contribute significantly to the heterogeneity of the estimates of depression and anxiety. So the tool might one tool might see it higher than another and the cutoff. So that's one thing is to agree, but that measure you use wants to be simple, easy to administer, and it needs to be reliable. So that means particularly if you give it to the same person again, you would get the same answer because that's the reliability of that tool and the measure. And I think if that was agreed, it would make it easier for people to then say, in your setting, could you do a sample, a random sample, every six months or a year, 10,000 children, and let's see where the estimates of these important measures are. And some of the measures that like fear and ang- are, are dissipating, and hopefully what happens is anxiety comes down. But one of the key measures is we don't yet understand that because we still haven't done the medium to long-term studies yet. Yeah, I think that's um, it's a challenge in the sense that we'll have some cultural sensitivities in certain countries where you know, mental health is thought of in a particular way or the instruments that we use in high income com- countries might not be completely appropriate. Is that a barrier at all to this kind of global effort that we'd like to see? Yes, it is. And I think you're right about the cultural sensitivities. But I think that also says and adds value to doing the right research in the right context and populations. I think it's important to consider that mental health problems are generally worse in those with financial difficulties. And therefore, you know, we've had uh, support from issues like the furlough scheme, but many countries that have shut down or disconnected their, their education didn't have support from furlough, didn't have the same infrastructure from broadband so you can connect to the world. So I think it's even more important to do the work in those areas because you may find that the problems are heightened and much more problematic and prevents them from growing as an economy, but also from them individuals going into society, as we've said, with the right tools to go forward. Yeah, I mean, in my field, whereas most of the suicides in the world occur in low and middle income countries, Mm -hmm. The majority of the research that's being carried out is in high income countries. So we have this kind of disjunct between what we know and what we need to know. And I think that's something that's really important to explore moving forward. Yeah, I'd agree with that. And I think there's always a a potential to do research where you can find the data easier and it's accessible. And we as researchers do research sometimes in our own interest because we can publish it in a high impact journal. But actually, in this case, I think there's a coordinated global effort because i think it's quite clear the problem is so great that actually it can't be ignored 
and it shouldn't be done by a few researchers and it needs some of these bodies to get together we've got a uk children's commission and you've got save the children and then you've got researchers like yourself who could connect and go hmm, do you know what what's it going to look like if we're going to truly understand the impact of this in the medium to long term but also if there are other exposures that come along in the future that we can understand and mitigate the impact of yes and have some sort of real time surveillance because the systems are already in place that would be really helpful yeah i agree with that carl i could talk to you all day this is just so fascinating and interesting is there anything else you want to reflect on before we perhaps wrap up this discussion no i think we've covered all of the uh, major issues i think the one thing i'd say is most of the data is limited to 2020 and there may be there's a tendency very early on this for lots of people to get excited and do lots of research lots of studies and as we go forward there may be a tendency for to say well this is all in the past and this is the future and actually not to do these studies so i think it's imperative we switch on to these important issues and i think that's the main point for collateral global to identify those areas which should be a priority for policymakers particularly to say we need to understand the true impact so we'll be coming back at the end of 2021 to say update this review and what we're hoping is there's some higher quality evidence emerging but i have this and my own anxiety is that people may switch off and go and look at other areas and, and we may not get this evidence emerging. And I think it's it's essential we do. Absolutely, um, particularly in certain areas. So we know, for example, suicides hmm. may not increase during a disaster, but they do after the disaster and certainly when we see economic downturns. So for me, that very long-term data is going to be absolutely vital to understand the true impact of, of all the measures that we've implemented. Yeah, I'd agree with that. I think it's at the moment the impact on suicide is uncertain, but quite a few areas like like that, which may be medium to long term consequences. It's similar to childhood vaccination programs that were devastated in 2020 for areas like measles, mumps and rumella, polio in places like Afghanistan and Pakistan decimated the programs. You may see the impact actually 12, 24 months out when actually you see the consequences because it's actually storing up the problem, aren't you? As opposed to seeing what's happening on the ground there and then. Exactly. Well, Carl, it's been a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you so much for all the amazing work that you and your team do. It's it's really helping to um, um, understand what, what's gone on in the pandemic and, and what we need to do next. Thanks, Alan. It's been a pleasure.